Okay guys, it is finally time for my Sony A7 III low light astrophotography review. I've had this camera for a couple of months now. I've taken it down to the, the coast of South Wales to photograph the Milky Way, my first Milky Way shots of the season. I also took it on a trip to Cappadocia in Turkey where again I was photographing the Milky Way in dark places. So I can finally give my opinion on this camera now and the long story short I'm pretty damn impressed. I'm really happy with this camera. So what is the Sony a7 III? It is Sony's latest full frame mirrorless camera. Following on from the a7 and the a7 Mark II, it comes with a 24.2 megapixel full frame sensor. However, this time the sensor is backlit. It comes with backside illumination architecture, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, but it does promise better low light performance than the predecessors. Now the camera comes with a 2000 pound price tag, which isn't exactly the cheapest camera on the market, but when you compare it to other cameras with the same features and specs, it's pretty damn good. It has the same updated body as the A9 and the A7R3. I've had the A7S II, I use it to film my vlogs, but it was never really nice to hold, even though I've got Donald Trump small hands, it was still just a little bit fiddly, but the new body is slightly bigger. You can barely tell just by looking at it, but when you hold it in your hand, it's just so much more comfortable in the hand. The buttons are a bit more chunky and a bit more logically placed. The dials are chunkier, which is a huge benefit because on the A7S II, when using the dials, I find myself accidentally pressing buttons because they're so flimsy and just so easy to press. But the dials are chunkier, it's nicer to grip. It's just a refined design. They really hit the nail on the head with this one. Now, because of the bigger body, they've managed to squeeze a bigger battery in there and it's a huge improvement. It feels like a DSLR. I left this thing time-lapsing for five hours one night and I came back to find 63% battery left, which is really impressive. I keep finding myself surprised at how much battery is left when I'm out in the field using this camera. Another new benefit that we haven't seen on the Mark IIs is dual SD card slots. So you can either back up your shots as you're shooting or you can just use them both separately. Uh, switching over to slot 2 when slot 1 fills up. Lastly, there is USB charging, which is sweet because between locations you can use like a portable power bank and charge your camera on the go in the field really easily. I'm really enjoying the, uh, the USB charging. They've also now included a joystick, which is more for people who re rely on autofocus, but it makes focusing on the stars a lot quicker and a lot easier. But let's get into the juicy bits, the low light, high ISO performance. Long story short, it's good. It's really good. I've been really impressed with this sensor. But if you see a review on YouTube, online or anywhere else comparing the noise in the images between ISO 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, and they say that the noise levels are different as you get higher in the ISO, Turn that shit off because it's wrong and they don't know what they're talking about. The A7 III is an ISO invariant camera. It has two levels of ISO invariance between 100 and 400 and between 800 and upwards. What this means is that you can take images at 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12,800 and it will have the same amount of noise. So these images, for example, were all taken at f2.8 for 20 seconds but at different ISOs, so 800, 1600, 3200. And then when you balance the exposures in post-production, you can see that they all have the exact same amount of noise in there. So changing the ISO, pushing the ISO higher, doesn't add more noise to the image, doesn't make the image more noisy. This camera is ISO invariant. And in order to understand this, you need to know a little bit more about the image capturing process that goes on within the camera itself. There are a few advantages to using ISO invariant cameras. For one, if you accidentally or underexpose or overexpose using the wrong ISO, it doesn't matter because you can just adjust the exposure in post-production later on. The other added benefit I see for these is Aurora time lapses in particular. So when I'm using my Canon 60, I would shoot an Aurora time lapse at ISO 6400 because that's the Canon 60's best low light noise performance. However, if during that time lapse the Aurora started getting really strong and erupting into sort of bright, vibrant colors, 
the highlights would definitely blow in that time lapse and I'd lose a lot of detail. If I'm using the Sony A7 III, I can shoot the time lapse at ISO 800. And if I need to boost the exposure in post, I can boost the exposure in post. And if the Aurora kicks off and gets really bright, there's less chance of the highlights blowing because I'm shooting at ISO 800. This also kind of comes into play if you're photographing a moonscape, for example, and the, the highlights of the moon are blowing out, you can just bring the ISO down and still reveal the same amount of detail in the shadows as if you were shooting at ISO 6400. Now, prior to this, I've always shot on the Canon 6D, so I'm going to do a bit of a comparison between the Sony a7 III and the Canon 6D. Okay, so on the left, we have the Canon 6D, and I've opted for the ISO 6400 shot because this is where the Canon 6D shows its best low light performance. And I used exactly the same settings on the image on the right, which I took with the Sony. Both of these were taken with the Samyang 20mm f1.8 lens. Uh, it was a Canon mount lens, which I used on the Sony with a Sigma MC11 adapter. Uh, but if we just take a look at the noise, you can see that the Sony definitely has less noise. The Canon is a little bit more chaotic and the Sony has slightly more detail which comes at no surprise because it's 24 megapixels versus 20. We take a look at Jupiter. The Sony is definitely a lot cleaner. Now I've lifted the shadows and I've lifted the blacks on both of the images. Again, we've got the Canon on the left and the Sony on the right. The exact same images again. But what you will see is that when you lift in detail out of the shadows, let's take a zoom in here. So much more noise in the Canon image. It's just so chaotic. Yes, the Sony a7 III is quite noisy, but considering we've lifted the shadows and the blacks by a hundred each, it's pretty damn impressive. What you'll also notice in the Canon as well is this purple sort of discoloring going on in the shadow areas. Um, this is quite typical for Canon sensors. I think the 5D Mark IV is a little bit better, but you can see that even when lifting the shadows and the blacks on the Sony, you get no discoloration in the shadows. Super impressive. A lot more detail, much less noise. There's a little bit of pink going on on the side of the frame. I think this is amp glow, um, but otherwise the image as a whole is amazing and I've really enjoyed being able to pull detail out of the shadows of a single exposure with the Sony. I mean, look at the difference here. Super impressive. So much more detail, not much noise in the shadows. And yeah, this sensor is just an absolute joy to work with. Now guys, please don't ask me how this camera compares to camera X or camera Y. I don't know. I've only really used this, the Canon 6D before this camera. However, you can use DP Review's studio test and you can choose any camera you want to compare it to, put the ISO to 3200, 6400, whatever, and you can compare the noise. Okay, so one very important thing for astrophotographers is the star eater issue that has plagued Sony cameras. If you don't know what the star eater issue is, it's a noise reduction algorithm that Sony applies to the RAW files. It's a noise reduction called spatial filtering and it tries to tackle things like hot pixels, but it does this at the RAW level and there's no way to turn it off. What happens is that the noise reduction algorithm mistakes stars for hot pixels and actually removes them from the RAW file and there's no way to turn this off. A lot of the astrophotography community have been in uproar about this and, and rightfully so. I took some images with the exact same settings, the exact same lens on the Canon 60 and the Sony a7 III. Same images again, the Canon on the left, the Sony on the right, same settings using the same lens. Let's see if we can see any stars being removed. I really can't see any stars being removed. 
it might have helped if I took a shorter exposure because these stars are trailing a little bit but I can't see any difference Don't get me wrong, this test is hardly conclusive. Uh, I need to do a bit more testing with telephoto lenses and star trackers and, and bulb mode. If I do find some star eater issues with telephotos or when using a star tracker, I'll make an updated video. But if I don't find anything, then I'm not gonna make another video because it doesn't look as if the star eater issue is causing any problems for, for my general use at least. Okay, color science is a big issue for me. When I use the Sony a7S II, the reason I don't shoot many stills with it is because the color of the raw files is just weird. I can't, I don't know, it's a very personal thing. Although I know a lot of people out there have said the older Sonys are not great with color, but just found a really weird green overcast tint to the image and it was very difficult to remove. However, the Sony a7 III definitely has very much improved color science. I'm finding it a lot more similar to the Canon colors that I'm used to with the 60. It's just a lot more pleasing. There's no more weird tinge or cast to it. No weird green color to the raw files. I'm just really enjoying the colors straight out of camera. They look great, punchy, and yeah, they're just really, really nice. One really useful feature of these Sony cameras, which I've been loving, is something called bright monitoring. It's hidden away in the menu. In fact, you can't even turn it on in the menu. You have to assign it to a custom button. Once you've done that, pressing the custom button will temporarily stream the live view on the rear LCD at the camera's highest ISO. And with a shutter speed of, I think it's like a quarter of a second or maybe half a second. So you're essentially seeing a live view feed of long, short-ish exposures but it allows you to compose in the dark. You can kind of see in the dark and you can compose before you take your shot. This saves so much time in the field, which means you get more time shooting worthwhile photos. I love this feature. Whenever I go back to shoot on my Canon 60, it just makes it feel so old. And I miss that feature. It's really, really useful. The a7 III comes with built-in Wi-Fi and NFC, and these two work together really well. I mean, you can use your smartphone as a sort of live view feed, and you can control the camera from your smartphone. But by far my favorite feature is the ability to transfer photos from the camera to your phone. Now, I know cameras in the past can do this, even my Canon 60 can do this, but it's just the ease of use with the Sony a7. So long as your smartphone has NFC, you just tap it to the side of the Sony a7 body whilst you are previewing the image that you want to transfer. Once the camera detects the NFC from your smartphone, it will automatically make the Wi-Fi connection. You don't have to touch another button. Once it's made the connection, it will transfer the photo to your phone. It transfers a JPEG. I don't think there's a way to transfer RAWs in such a way but it's still really useful and you can instantly share that photo on social media or your Instagram stories, but it's just the ease of use that I love about it. With the Sony's, it's just whoop, touch the side, it transfers over, good to go. Okay, onto some negatives then. There's no built-in intervalometer. In the older Sony cameras, you could go to the Play Memories app and you could download a time-lapse app, use it in the camera and you could program your camera to do a time-lapse. They've now scrapped the Play Memories app. Uh, you can't use it with the newer Mark III bodies. But not only that, they didn't put the feature into the standard menu. So there's no built-in intervalometer, which is quite a shame. But hopefully they add it in with a firmware update in the future. For now, I've been using a cheap intervalometer from Amazon. And as somebody who takes a lot of long distance selfies, I like to have a wireless remote for the camera as well and the only one available for Sony right now is super expensive so I've taken my Sidandi Canon wireless intervalometer and simply swapped the cable for a Sony cable and it works so super happy with that one other small negative is that whilst most of the camera is pretty weather sealed all of the buttons and dials are weather sealed the plastic doors on the side of the camera are not weather sealed how much of a problem this is going to be 
only time will tell. But it's a shame that they didn't kind of weather seal the whole camera. But that's about it. I mean, for the price, what you get in this camera is incredible. I can see me using this camera for many years to come. In terms of low light performance, it is excellent. I think 24 megapixels strikes a chord. You get really good detail in the RAW files, but it's not too many megapixels that the image becomes noisy because bigger pixels have a better advantage in low light performance. Things like bright monitoring just make it a joy to use in the dark. I love the new body, the updated Mark III body. It's just better to hold. The buttons and dials are just nicer to use. And yeah, I'm really, really happy with this camera. There's not a lot wrong with it. And I think I'm gonna be using this for many, many years to come. Anyway, if you have any questions about the A7 III, please get in the comments below. Got plenty of vlogs coming up from Cappadocia in Turkey. And yeah, if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.